<laughs> okay. Um, first, my first question for the people in the class is, do you have uh, access to the handout? Or do you have the handout? Uh, yeah, I have it. Okay. I do not. I didn't see that there was a handout. Ah, okay. Um, it's... Okay, we can work around that. I've got examples of the things that are on the handout. Uh, uh, maybe after the class, you can, uh, you can download it, which may make sense of some more sense of some of the things I've said. I'm saying. Where would we find the handout? Because I wasn't given. Um, oh, it's under handouts on the full website. Never mind. Sorry. About okay. That. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, it's 11 o'clock. I was going to start to wait till 11.01, but I think we haven't changed the number of people uh, in a couple of minutes. And if, well, anyway, separate sleeves and how to attach them. Um, I've sent the link for the handout. Thank you. Okay. Most of our information comes from art. And, uh, you know, we don't really have much available before the 16th century, and even uh, most of that is pretty fragmentary. But if you look at uh, look at images, even back as far as the 12th or 13th century, or possibly earlier, there's a lot of separate sleeves. I, okay, we assume they're separate. A lot of them are separate sleeves because they're a different color from the main garment. Um, so, this is a separate sleeve, sorry, and it's um, it goes with a matching partlet, but that's not always the case. Like the sleeves I'm wearing are separate from the from the um, the kirtle, like they're they're tied on. Um, most of our material, of, of, uh, most of the your video isn't on did you mean to show us oh that? is my video on no it's not sorry i was oh. looking into that there we go okay hey, we can there we go Yay. hi hello okay. <laughs> separate sleeve okay okay and here's another separate sleeve that's um that the one i was mentioning that goes with a uh, with a partlet we'll go into detail about that later anyway the earliest um in, no, let me think. Sorry. Oh, uh, another thing I meant to ask. Uh, this is the first time I'm doing this class. So if you could make notes about either ask me questions if, if uh, there's something that comes up, uh, you know, raise your hand and interrupt or make a note and I'll, I'll uh, track how this works. Separate sleeves. We are assuming that a lot of the sleeves that are different colors in images, different color from the main body of the garment in images are separate. Um, it's very hard to tell how most of them are attached because a lot of them, there's some kind of shoulder treatment that, that covers the, uh, the attachment point between the sleeve and the, and the bodice. Um, sometimes you don't, you know, you cannot be 100% sure whether a sleeve that's a different color is separate or is simply a sewn on sleeve of a different color. On the flip side, you can't always tell if a sleeve is the same color that it's not separate. And I'll show you an example later. Uh, okay, for starters, the earliest, uh, um, I think the earliest image I've got is maybe 13th, 14th century, and the sleeve is pinned on. There's a short sleeve uh, in the main garment, and then there's a different colored sleeve pinned on. Um, oh, I don't have one of those, but I've, I've mocked it up here. The weight of the pin depends on the weight of the fabric. Both of these are fairly lightweight wools, and I don't know if you can, I don't know if there's enough light. Let me see if I can shine a light through it. Uh, can you see that it's made, it's made holes? No, you can't. <laughs> okay. Um, so the technique that's most obvious was being pinned on at one point on the shoulder, 
Now, the weight of, as I said, the weight of the pin depends on the weight of the, um, of the fabric. What I use for something like a lightweight suiting is a short brass pin. There's an image in the handout that uh, compares the pin to uh, an ordinary glass headed pin. But this in effect is what you get. You just stick a pin through it, the top of the sleeve onto the sleeve that's of the main garment. Um, there are some examples in the um, six, well, later that um, look as if they're fancy sleeves with brooches. You know, like this is not a period, the 16th century brooch, but using a brooch instead of a pin. In the handout, um, they're three different images of pinned on sleeves. The first one is a very simple sleeve that you can actually see the pin in it. The second one, you can't see the pin. Now, possibly uh, it would be stitched on, but I think that's extremely unlikely. I think the pin is put in so that it's burrowed into the cloth so it doesn't stick people, or the artist just ignored it because everybody knows you pin them on and they couldn't be bothered. Um, then there's a, the third example is, uh, I'm pretty sure it's pinned. Again, this whole thing is, it's really hard to tell, but I am pretty sure the third example is pinned. It's a pained sleeve over a big fluffy undersleeve, and I can see one something here, and I'm, it, I'm, 90% sure it's a brooch. So it is a pin sleeve, but it's a big fancy pin sleeve rather than the ordinary uh, everyday sleeves uh, in the first two examples. So pinning is one way uh, that sleeves are held on. Um, again, because they're pins, because they, you know, you can't cuddle up to somebody without being careful. I would say that they were used a fair bit, but they probably weren't, uh, pinning wasn't the uh, most popular way of attaching sleeves. Um, we, the method I think was probably most used is tying them on. Now, Janet Arnold, here we have actual examples. Um, in uh, Janet Arnold's book, uh, the, uh, Patterns of Fashion circa 1560-1620 has a bunch of tied on sleeves. And there's a whole bunch of different ways that was done. The, to tie a sleeve on, you need something to pass the tie through, both on the sleeve and on the, um, on the body of the garment. Now what they were tied on with were called points. They're lengths of something. Um, there are images uh, on the web of lengths of, of bunches of leather points being, uh, you know, used or sold or whatever. But this, for example, is a piece of what, third of an inch ribbon. And on the end, these little thingies are called aglets. They're, uh, they're little brass, sort of blunt little brass um, cones. And the point, the, the point of them is to put them through eyelets, like, I don't know if you can, let's see. Like this, uh, there's, like many dresses, this one has got a series of eyelets and getting a, a string through it without these egglets is a pain in the hindquarters. I've done it, but you have to either use a hook or a needle or a lot of swearing. Um, okay, the, this is another, um, another, uh, point. This one doesn't have aglets because it usually lives in the loop of a... Uh, uh, yes? Hello, Hello. Uh, we had a question. Uh, do you see tied sleeves as early as the 1200s or more later period? There's no way to tell. I, ha I, I, okay, partly because I don't have access to libraries at the moment and can't go through many, 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 many books, of, books on art, which is what I'd normally do. I haven't run across them when I was doing the research for this paper, but I would guess that they go back a long way. I have a vague memory of an early, very early period tied sleeve with you no know, dangling points like I've got on, on this thing, but I couldn't find it. So it, 
it's really a matter of style. Um, in like in one of the um, examples that that Janet Arnold gives of an extant piece, it has the uh, the the point still in the in the garment. So the, the garment and sleeve are laced together, and the way it's done, when the garment would if the garment were worn, you couldn't see that it was tied, which is one of the challenges. And then there's a oh very early 15th century image uh, where the points are a major, major fashion feature of the garment. So they're, you know, the garment is sort of a gold and yellow and the points are long blue ribbons and they flew fall over everything and flutter in the air. So how points are tied is, is hugely fashionable. And I, I suspect, but haven't been able to find evidence um, that um, it was one of these things where the fashions changed pretty quickly. It's it's cheap and relatively cheap and uh, quick and easy to change how you tie your points. Uh, okay, tied points. Let's see. One method. Okay, here I've got two. I've got two small examples of the. Here the points are are stitched onto the uh, onto the garment. Know, say this were the shoulder and this was the sleeve, you'd tie them together. On one I've got egglets, on the other one I don't, because in this case you don't need egglets. So if your points are tied on, um, you don't have to pass them through eyelets. Uh, on the other hand, on this, um, okay, let's get it right side out. On this partlet, Again, it's, yeah, I think they are visible. There are aglets uh, through the shoulder of the partlet. Now, this is a fairly thin silk. So if, if you're going to be uh, working with a thin fabric or one that isn't particularly strong, I would recommend putting in something reinforcing. Like I've got a, a thin strip, a narrow strip of twill tape stitched to the edge between the edge and the eyelet so that, you know, the force of the, of the uh, points pulling on it, holding the sleeve up, doesn't rip through. And the matching sleeve has got matching eyelets in the top. Um, okay, oh dear, I left one of my examples back here, but let's go through other tied methods. So let's see, there's, Oh yes, there's a lovely example of, gee, I wouldn't have t been able to tell that if it weren't for the fact that I've got actual documentation. One of the extant garments, which is this beauty, which is in Pisa. The sleeves are tied on. They match the dress but they're tied on. Um, and this, Do you want to know the name of that particular garment? Okay, uh, it's, um, if you uh, pull down the, um, the documentation, I've got the, the name of it. It's held in Pisa at the uh, Palazzo Reale. It's curiously enough, they figure that this one is contemporaneous with Eleonora of Toledo. It's cut exactly the same way as the, as the Eleonora of Toledo funeral dress. And they figure it may have been made by, by her tailor for one of her ladies in waiting. They don't think it's hers because um, uh, her wardrobe accounts don't mention a dress of this particular type. It's red velvet with the uh, um, applique gold cord in very ornate patterns. Uh, okay, now, if you excuse me for just a moment, I'm going to go get the other example, which I ought to have had to hand, but hey, back in a minute. Um, so for those of you who are just joining, I have linked the handout if you haven't received it in the chat. Um, and all of her bibliography and things are there. And if anybody is interested in specifically the Janet Arnold books, the School of Historical Dress is uh, redoing them. So if you would like to look into that, those are also available. I'm going to link that just in the chat. Thank you. That's amazing to know. 
Hi, I'm back. Yay. One of the main ways of uh, putting points on is this, it's called a lacing strip because you don't always want to make holes in your garment for whatever reason and um, lacing strips are basically a long rectangle of fabric with the, the uh, eyelets made through it. Uh, it's, you know, it's clean finish like this. I folded it in half, tucked the ends in, put the eyelets in, and then very carefully sewed it to the inside of the doublet. Um, I, didn't, I didn't make an extra hem there because of the bulk. So it's over, overcast all the way along. But these appear a lot in a lot of the garments in the Janet Arnold books, uh, not just at the shoulders, but at the waist of uh, of pants, for example. Oh, Helena, yeah. Could you define what you mean by overcast, please? It's uh, okay. I don't think you can see it, but it's a. Do I have a needle here? Because that would be the easiest way. Here. This is going to be a slightly clunky example because I don't have a sewing needle here. But basically overcast is you, okay, okay. Uh, can you see me? Okay, so I'm using a, a, a skinny knitting needle instead of, so you push the needle through, come over, then go back to the same side you started with. So what happens is that it, uh, it creates a series of loops over the edge of the fabric and that uh, helps keep it from fraying. It's, it, no, it, it goes over the edge. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. It's sometimes also called whip stitch. So that finally remembered the other name for it. Uh, okay, so let's see, we've covered attached points of two different kinds, um, eyelets. Now, uh, in the handout, that I put in a link to uh, uh, a blog where there's a really good description of how to do eyelets. Oh, I know what I forgot. The other thing is there is a very specific knot that's used a lot. Now, I'm going to try doing this but it basically comes out looking like this. It's got a single loop at the top and the um, ends of the points dangle. And once you get used to this, I'm not sure which one it is. The, the joy of this kind of knot is that you can undo it just by pulling one end. It's, it's quite secure and it's easy to undo. And if you've ever wound up picking away at your lacing, trying to get the dratted thing undone at the end of a very long day, this is a nice knot. I've put a link to um, oh, Drea Leeds Elizabethan costuming page in the handout. And there she gives, again, a really good description of how to tie this knot. Once I'm, you know, it's amazing. Once, once you've, gotten used to doing it, your fingers will remember, even when you're do in the middle of the first time doing a class on Zoom. Okay, so we've done eyelets, we've done attached points, we've done, um, what was the other thing we did? Lacing strips, and now lacing rings. This one was again hard to find evidence. Um, I would guess they were less popular for a couple of reasons. One being they're probably a lot more expensive. You know, metal was not cheap in period and uh, thread was more likely to hand. You could, most women could probably make their own if necessary. And the other ways of holding on uh, uh, doing lacing are all thread based. But this is, um, I, it's pretty obvious how lacing rings work. I'll just, yeah. There's this method, but in the uh, in the handout, I did find one example. It's a hilarious port. Well, hilarious. It's one of these saints with a big hole on, in her body and a big grin on her face paintings, but she has her sleeves held on with. Um, 
lacing rings, but how is it they've been laced on? I, I can't really tell how, they, how they're tied because that's not visible in the painting. I would guess they just tied them behind and tucked the ends in. But she's got pairs of little bars like this, which you can do with lacing. Um, I don't know whether you've uh, run into uh, ladder lacing on bodices sometimes where instead of, of being at an angle, like with spiral lacing, the lacing is horizontally. You can do that with, um, with lacing rings as well, but that's not what this class is about. Okay, so we've, how are we doing for time? Oh, we're doing good. Um, we've barely scratched the surface. Your pacing has been great. If um, it needs to change, I will tell you to slow down or speed up, okay? Okay, thank you. No problem. Okay, in the handout there are examples of, of uh, all the methods that um, I've done. Now, buttons and loops. This is one that I had. Uh, it's again, one of those things that it's really hard to tell. The um, image I've got in the in the handout, I'm ninety again one of those ninety nine percent sure it's buttons and loops, simply because it's got. Judging from the image, there are about ten of these, you know, blingy objects. Uh, dug these out of my button box. I have no idea where they came from. Um, all around her armhole, and there's. Uh, uh, her smock showing through. So it's all very fancy. If these were separate brooches, if they were pinned on separately, they'd shred, they'd eventually shred the sleeve and the, um, and the um, bodice. Now I used, uh, I used tape because that's, I wasn't going to go into a major sewing thing. But this, for example, this one, I made, left a nice big gap for, um, for uh, the non-existent smock or puffies to show through, and they really do unbutton. Quite often, this, this section, the loop section, is part of the dress, like the dress will be cut with a sort of triangle-y thing, and uh, you know, the buttonhole made through it, or a thread loop. Again, I, there weren't any clear images that made it obvious whether it was buttonholes, tapes, or thread loops. Um, That's one of the challenges of researching niggly little details like how do you hold your sleeves on. But one of these days the libraries will be back online. Okay, so we've got button loops. Uh, oh yes, this is a fun one. This is another one from Janet Arnold. This one surprised me, hooks and eyes. People used hooks and eyes like crazy in period. And, but I was surprised to find uh, uh, that there is a sleeve with hooks and eyes in it. When I was making this sample, something else was interesting because you know, usually you have to sew the hooks and eyes on and you hook them together. So there are two ways this can go. But you know, with the eyes inside the uh, bodies or inside the shoulder and the hooks on the, on the sleeve. But also, depending on whether the sleeve is lined, Like if the sleeve is unlined, it has to go this way. Like I, again, this is the outside, this is the inside. Because if, if the sleeve is unlined, then you don't want them to go. Yes? I, um, I have a question. So is there any evidence that you found of the, like the pointed hooks on either end that are found sometimes in the, in the um, Italian garments? Pointed hooks? Yeah, so instead of having like hooks and eyes, um, what they found, I can't remember the resource, I will have to send it to you. It's, um, they're hooks, but they're like, they hook into the fabric to almost like hook like this. So it's like two hooks instead of, uh, or like two pins instead of um, a hook and an eye. 
No, I haven't. I would like that. I'd very much appreciate that. Okay, because I will, once I've unpacked my school books, I will find it for you. X. Yeah. So, let me think. Yeah, if, okay, but, um, if the sleeve is unlined, you'll wind up with the outs, with the inside of the hooks on the outside of the sleeve. Yeah, it's a bit of a fiddle. Like, let me write. In, out. Okay, uh, is that visible? I've just written in and out on it. Okay. No, it's really hard to see because of the light that's shining right directly on it. Uh, hang on a minute. Let me turn that light off. Let's see if that makes sense. Is that any better? A little bit, yeah. Okay, so this is the inside of the sleeve because this is where the, you know, the backs of the stitches go. Um, but if, the, if your hooks are on the outside, I guess I'm being confusing. Basically what I'm saying is if you look, if you want to use hooks and eyes, make sure that you uh, check the, the uh, which, which way the hooks are supposed to go, which side they're supposed to be on, because you could wind up with uh, the, hooks on, the hooks showing the wrong side. This is the, uh, the only one of these methods that isn't self-evident. Okay, so let's see. Buttons and loops. Oh yes, of course, basting. This is another one that that um, is hard to do to document because if, if you don't, you know, if a sleeve is sewn in, you can't tell whether it's sewn in or basted. So this this poor little partlet, I basted one of the sleeves in. And I'll even eventually take it out and it'll lace up again. Um, that was a hard one to, uh, to find evidence of, but somebody on the Elizabethan costuming page, when I whined to them about help, I'm having trouble finding basting, uh, sent me a line in Chaucer that says something about basted sleeves. <laughs> now, this may or may not be basted in the shoulders. It could be basted closed, but I suspect basting was used all over the place. Like, for example, my cuffs are basted in. Yeah, oh, because they got to be washed, and I'm not going to wash the sleeve every time the the cuffs need the cuffs need washing. And then there are a couple of methods that um, I couldn't find evidence of, but are Okay, I, I would say that these are methods that are fine if you're not doing historical reproduction or, uh, or a, a working on a pent entry. Um, one is thread loops. Now, I, it, I've used thread loops in this garment for a very specific reason. The, um, the fabric is thick. And if I put in, and I didn't want to put eyelets through that would be visible on the outside. And I found that uh, enough thickness to make, a, a, what's it called? Lacing strip, just raise the, sh the shoulder too far off. I suppose I could have used a thinner fabric, but you know, hey, thread. So I made uh, basic uh, thread bars. Now these are, the thread bars are period. Um, they appear, uh, I actually found an image of one in one of the, uh, in one of the uh, patterns of fashion books. Now it was used on a partlet, but it shows that the technique was, was uh, available. The other one that again, I haven't found evidence of is using a piece of tape with gaps. Um, just lacing through the gaps. The reason I picked up on this one is it's one of the um, conjectural methods for doing uh, ladder lacing, which uh, I mentioned earlier. It appears a lot in Venetian 
gowns, and I think some of the Cranach paintings show ladder lacing. So I figure if they're doing it for ladder lacing, uh, possibly doing it for ladder lacing. I don't know if there's any extant, any period evidence of it having been used, but if people are using it for ladder lacing, I think it's perfectly legitimate for holding on sleeves. And then there's my, my personal bet noir, which is grommets. I would strongly, oh yes, there's also lacing strips with machine-made buttonholes. That's uh, mentioned occasionally. You know, yeah, the long seams are, you at least the long seams are usually done by machine nowadays. Um, and it's tempting to make machine-made uh, buttonholes instead of eyelets. But unless it drives you absolutely crazy to do, uh, do handwork, I would suggest just doing eyelets. The two take about the same amount of time. That's, per, that's again, my personal view. The other one is grommets. I, hmm? um, just so everybody knows, you can actually now get machine-made um, eyelet lacing, eyelet strips. So if yeah. you want it to look more authentic without actually having to do the handwork yourself and avoiding grommets, they are available at most uh, Notion stores, except Fabricland, because Fabricland is Fabricland. Anyway, uh, fabric land is fa fabric land is polyester city. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The the tapes are available and they're very effective. But again, grommets I don't like. Uh, they're an industrial post period industrial um, product. Also, they rip out. A friend of mine, oh, her very first outfit was laced through grommets. And after uh, not that long, she was having constant problems with the dratted things ripping out. Because unlike eyelets, which in theory don't actually uh, cut into the structure of the fabric, and you, you know, if, if all goes well, you push the threads apart. Though I do find like, like this, the, this silk of this partlet, I did break a few threads putting in the eyelets simply because the stuff's so tight woven and has so little stretch. But usually eyelets, you can make them without ripping holes in the fabric, whereas grommets, you have to cut a grommet's a, a, an appropriate size hole in the fabric for the grommet usually. Okay, that's it. So just to recap, as it's going to be short of an hour, the, the, the methods I found that are documentable for period are pinning, tying using sewn on points, separate points with eyelets or lacing strips or lacing rigs, hooks and eyes, buttons and loops. Um, the ones that I, I'm quite comfortable using except for museum quality reproductions and pant entries are, uh, oh yeah, also combinations of methods, I forgot about that. I, I can see no reason for not, say, taking a garment that has ri lacing rings. Of course, I pick up the one without the, eye, without the um, you know, taking a garment that has lacing rings and tying points in. The one I'm wearing is also combined. The shoulder has eyelets, the sleeve has eyelets in it and the shoulder has um, thread bars. Um, okay, the ones that I haven't been able to document but are practical and use period materials are points and uh, uh, points with tapes, you know, through the tapes like uh, ladder lacing, hooks and thread loops, that's another one. Um, in today's couture, uh, thread loops are used a lot instead of the eyes of hooks and eyes. It's partly, I, I think initially, largely uh, to reduce the amount of metal showing. The other is I find that they come undone less easily than, than uh, metal eyes with movement. And the other one is points and thread loops. Okay. Uh Helena, if, are you open to some questions? If people put them in the chat and I will ask them and then you can address them so that we're not talking over each other. Sure, hang on, let me uh, open up the chat room. Okay, yeah, would you answer the, uh, ask the questions and I'll try and answer them. 
Excellent. Is there any evidence of reversible sleeves? Not that I found. Uh, uh, it's not something I looked for, but I haven't found anything that said, hey, these sleeves are reversible. And it sounds practical, but uh, we, I'll have to wait for the libraries to look for that one. Um, do you have any recommendations of books that we could look into for further reading other than what's on your bibliography? Uh, I, okay, at the moment I have such limited uh, access to books. I would say any book that has uh, good images you know, good, good reproductions of period images. This is, this is one of those details that, you know, you find in that upper left corner of the picture. Excellent. Um, is there evidence of the points being sewn to the sleeve and then tied through an eyelet or lacing ring on the shoulder? There again, I haven't found any direct evidence. Uh, it's, I, I, Okay, I'm not an authority, but I'd say that probably happened all the time. <laughs> or variations of that, through eyelets, through lacing rings, whatever. If it worked, pr pr people probably did it. Excellent. Um, does anybody else have questions? Because it's all the ones I have in the chat at the moment. Oh, there's another one. Uh, very quick, since I missed the start, do you pin sleeves on the inside or the outside? Um, the evidence, the images I've, okay, the images that I've found um, look as if they may be pinned on both, uh, on either side. Uh, on the outs, the two of the images I have pinned sleeves show the pins on the outside, the, the one with the one bronze or brass pin and the one with the big fluffy paint sleeves and the brooch are pinned on the outside. The one with the woman holding a chicken in the air may be pinned on the inside because you can't see the pin. Um, uh, with the sex over the shorter gown sleeve, correct? I'm sorry? Sorry, um, with the pinning of the sleeve, with the sleeve over the shorter gown sleeve? So like this is the outside sleeve and it was over a shorter sleeve underneath. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it went right to the shoulder. Uh, as I say, the three images I've got in the, in the, uh, in the handout, what, the first one is over a shorter gown sleeve. The second, and, and you can see the pin. The second one is directly to what looks like the shoulder strap of her kirtle. Like, uh, she, she's got three layers. The inner one, I, it looks like it's pinned to her kirtle and it, you can't see the pin, so the, quite possibly it's pinned on the inside. Um, and I, either you, take, you do a lot of practice or it's, it's a period version of a safety pin which is called, uh, oh dear, it'll come back to me, but there, there are bro yo, fibula. So I, do, I don't know if that they were in use in period. I haven't seen, I haven't actually seen 16th century fibulas. Oh, look, she says, uh, Heather Dale says many thanks. I hadn't thought about a fibula, I'll look into it. Thank you, Heather. It's a good suggestion. I hadn't thought of a fibula either. I was just thinking, where the heck do they put that pin? The other, uh, the other possibility in that picture with the chicken is that the pin is on the outside, but it's covered by whatever the white, white garment is underneath the, uh, the black partlet. Uh, Interesting. Very cool. What is your favorite? This is a personal question. What is your favorite type of sleeve to do? Ah, uh, good question. It's, uh, yeah, at the moment I'm doing late period Italian and there's this, there aren't the huge sleeves. I think a, a sleeve made of something really gorgeous. At some point I want to do one of those crazy Tudor sleeves that's got, you know, fur and, uh, 
this big droopy thing and the fancy cuff and ouches all over the place or ouches. Um, if you're looking into that, uh, crap, uh, Kingston, uh, University of Kingston in England has a fantastic collection that I believe you can view online. So. Ah, the, this is period, a uh, tutor? I believe so, yes. Ah, tutor sleeve, yeah. And I know yeah. you can, I'm not sure if you still can, but for a while the Kensington collection was also available. Okay, I will look that up too. Uh, and we have a question from mm -hmm. Amelia. Do you have evidence of embroidered sleeves? There are, yeah. There are sleeves in paintings that I'm 90% sure are embroidered. Uh, the, the ones in the, in the, uh, on the red gown, I don't know whether you count that as embroidery. It's, it's couched cords. Um, I'm sure I have, I just haven't paid attention to that particular detail. Actually, that's a, that's a good question. Are there specific kinds of sleeves that uh, you're curious about? Me specific, or you asking the question? Anyway, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, and okay. you as well. Um, I'm still just getting used to, I'm doing um, German Renaissance, so I'm just getting used to doing all the hand sewing. Because ah, yes. I did uh, modern couture uh, sewing in school, so this is a very different animal. Yeah, but some of the techniques uh, have survived. Yes, yes. I cannot tell you the number of uh, thread loops I have done. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yes, actually, thread thread of of all the uh, sort of tech the little detail techniques. I think thread loops are probably the ones that I've. I've most frequently used because they're so very useful all over the place. Uh, we have another question. Mm -hmm. um, what is the earliest period we see pinned sleeves? I don't know. Uh, the earliest image I was able to find that was clearly pinned, and again, this was because I appealed to the interwebs. Uh, is that early, I think it's early 16th century. Let, let me double check. But I, I'm fairly sure that, okay, the image I've got is, is uh, late 15th century, but I'm, I know I've seen images earlier than that, but I haven't been able to find them on the web. Okay. Uh, we still have about 10 minutes. So does anybody have any other questions or anything else they would like to, uh, ask or even discuss with Helena. Is it Helena or Helena? Helena. Helena, so sorry. Thank you. <laughs> there are so many pronunciations. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, so um, will I be able to get a printout of this chat? Because there's some, some good investigation, uh, some good research questions. Let me see if I can. No, I can't copy it. Uh, give me one second. I can copy it question for question. So what I will do is, uh, sorry, and the next question is, is contrast considered more a la mode in general? Uh, <laughs> okay. I would guess, this is, this is, okay, I'm, I'm running through A lot of the art I've seen with, okay, I, 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 mostly women's clothing. There is a fair bit of contrast. Um, it's, oh, it, it's, it, it's such a useful design thing. I am just um, writing out the questions for you now. Thank you. What I'd look at if you're curious about contrast, and as I say, it's not something I 
really paid attention to is the is the group scenes and things like the um, oh the the something wedding in in England and the the, the things like the peasant dance those uh, paintings from the Low Countries with large numbers of people. It's really, the, the, the one of the difficulties is that paintings of individuals, they're always, they're usually in their, in their best. And they're also a very small segment of society. Um, if you get the genre paintings, uh, like, sorry, it's not Bruegel, um, from the Low Country, from the painters in in the Low Countries, and there are some group paintings. Oh, what's his name? The the, the man who painted the kitchen scene in Italy. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. N Neither do I. It's one of my favorite paintings with the cat and the dog in the front. But uh, there, for example, in that one, pretty much everybody except the old woman who's dressed in black uh, is in sort of mute, in clear pastels. Sorry, you have another question. Just give me one moment. Okay. Bruegel. Bruegel. Thank you, April. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the okay. It. Sorry, I'm just running through all through all the group, all the mob scenes I can think of, and it so much depends on what the paint on the painter's eye, what he was, what he or she was aiming at. Um. I think like sleeve attachment, color choice is, difficult to be sure about. Uh, where we don't have, have uh, well, okay. What, one source that has a really good list of colors is the um, Moda Firenze because it has a list, it has um, an inventory of Eleonora of Toledo's wardrobe and pretty much for, for each item it gives what color it was. She liked green velvet slippers. Everybody's got their favorite, right? Everybody's got their favorite. Are there types of sleeves that people find interesting or challenging or are on their to-do list? Um, I want to, personally, I want to do one of the sleeves that is like, just have the one that's all the poofs and all of the wealth on one sleeve because they were so restricted. Oh, yes, yeah. Yes, um, and I want to, so, We've got, I want to try sleeves with poofs. Uh, I want to make Tudor four sleeves and non-slashed. I have some great silk. Want to show off the brocade. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, sleeves with poofs are, are great. Again, they appear in a lot of places. Um, just to, to in the uh, in the handout, I think there are at least two sleeves with poofs. Just not because I was looking for poofs, because but because they happened. One of the pinned in ones, then the red gown with the tied sleeves, um, and in the uh, image of the gown with the blue uh, blue ribbons as points. So you've got a pretty wide selection of times where you can you can effectively use poofs. Uh, brocade. Again, my, my focus tends to be late period Italy and a lot of the sleeves there are not slashed. So that, that would be a good place to use a brocade. Again, hmm? Would um, poof sleeves have a simple lining to help hold shape? Yes. 
I, okay, I just as somebody who's done an awful lot of sewing, I don't think there's any way that uh, that a lot of the very fancy poofs can be done without actually uh, having a structured, you know, structured sleeve underneath and the poofs working off that. Uh, the uh, the idea that it's all pulled through uh, through smock, I. I don't think that's that. I'm pretty sure that's unlikely or impossible for some of the structured sleeves. What I would do if I were making poofed sleeves is is definitely do a mock up because thing, the fabrics do some surprising things. Okay, excellent. Um, we have about five minutes left. Are there any other questions? Oh, and uh, so go ahead and. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, as I said when at the beginning, this is the first time I've done this course. Are there any areas where you'd like more detail, less detail? Uh, and are these samples that I did uh, visually effective? Uh the uh, Heather says the samples are hugely helpful. I agree with her. Um, and I think if we could actually see them in person, they would be even more effective. And if you could actually play with them and tie them in knots, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I would like to. I would like to do this class again, uh, particularly after access to the libraries is is uh, available, because it's it's. I guess I'm very much into detail, and this is one of those details that is, yes, samples of paintings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I have added those to the chat and we still have uh, three minutes to go. If you have any last questions, please do so. If not, many thanks to you, um, Helena, because this has been fantastic. Thank you all and thank you for the feedback. And see you. Yeah, I'll see you guys time. next time. All right, now I just gotta. Excellent. How to end. Oh, there it is. All right, have a good day, everybody. You too. Bye bye.